that. What one do you want to do first? This one? Over a million children in Britain have asthma. It's the most common chronic disease amongst young people. Life with Ruby's been difficult. From a very young age, she's had asthma. We've been in and out of hospital. We have infections, chest infections. It's not been great ever since she was tiny. And it is frightening. It's frightening for the whole family as well as Ruby. Okay. Ruby has had a lot of hospital admissions and she has had what I would say is severe asthma over a number of years. There have been times when the asthma has been life-threatening for Ruby. This board shows Ruby's morning and nighttime medicines, so we know what to give her. Right. I can do my inhalers by myself, but Mummy helps me do my tablets. Most children with asthma take a blue and brown inhaler, but as Ruby's asthma is more severe, she's on a long list of additional daily medication. She takes a lot of medicine. You'd look at her normally and think she's a well little girl, but a lot of medicines make her be that person. There you go, and that one. Good girl. And what do you think about taking all these medicines every morning? It's okay, but I don't like it. Afternoon, children's outpatients. The professor is Ruby's doctor and a pioneer in the treatment of children with asthma. That's one we've known quite well for a while. Yes. And these are... Today she's having a routine checkup to see how her current medication is working. We've had to see Ruby quite frequently in the clinics. We've had to very carefully fine tune her treatment, add different medicines. So you're going to see Papa Doctor? Yeah. You're going to do the blow machine? Yes. Make sure he's, make sure your medicine's all OK. Traditional treatment for children yeah. with severe asthma involves trying several different drugs over time to see what works best. But the professor believes that the genes of children like Ruby may make one drug more effective than another. It's not about the quantity of drugs, but taking the right one that matters. Come on through then. Do what we normally do. You sometimes find that the child is on three or four different medicines and they are expected to take it continuously, regularly, month in and month out, year in and year out. Come on then, Ruby, let's get you weighed and measured. Just we have started to question whether this is indeed the right way of treating asthma, particularly in children, because we found 15% of children, for example, carry a particular genetic change which makes them resistant to certain medicines that we commonly use in asthma therapy. And we've started to ask the question whether in these children it would be appropriate to withdraw medicines and substitute the medicine with something else. But this model needs to be tested through scientific studies. Hello. Hi. How are you? Fine, thank you. The professor is keen to test his theory. He wants to undertake a clinical drug trial where 100 children will have their DNA taken. If they fall into the 15% of children whose genes are resistant to the standard asthma medication, they'll be given a drug called Veribreath. The 100 strong control group who won't have their DNA tested will stay with the standard medication, Exhalin. I'm trying to get the application through to the Ethics Committee as soon as possible. The last date is today. I've almost finished it. I just need to cross a few T's and dot a few I's and send it off. The professor may believe his medical research is imperative to help children like Ruby, but first, his work has to be independently assessed. An ethics committee is made up of people from all walks of life. Their job is to look at the research plan from their own perspective and to decide whether they think this is the right way to go about it. Whether this piece of proposed research will ever see the light of day and become a medical trial is now in the hands of these six people. I think it's difficult to get drug trials approved in general, which is always a lot harder when it involves children. 
because children are a vulnerable population. How are you? Nice to see you. Fixed committees have a little bit of a bad reputation sometimes. People think we like to get in the way of what they want to do, but we're absolutely committed to helping good research go forward. But at the same time, it's our responsibility to make sure that the risks and the benefits weigh out in a good way and that people really do care about protecting the interests of the very good uh, individuals who volunteer to be part of their study. The professor's design for this proposed clinical trial is about to be put under the microscope, along with the information sheet he intends to give to parents and the accompanying consent forms. Only if it bears up to careful scrutiny will it get the go-ahead. Has everybody had a chance to look at the protocol and the accompanying paperwork? Yeah. Great. So basically my reading of it is that we're looking at children with quite severe asthma. So these are children and young people whose condition isn't well controlled with the standard two inhalers. So my understanding is that the first group uh, will be tested for this MAS gene. And if they're positive, they will be given Veribreath. And if they're negative, they'll be given exhaling. We would be taking them all off the medication for two weeks uh, beforehand, I think brings a scientific and a uh, ethical question in terms of is it right to, to take take them off the medication and have them on this washout. Uh, it would be more appropriate, in my view, to recruit children as they start to become to the point where they need that third line of defence drugs. There's a lot of nodding around the table. Do people share those concerns? Simon? Is it ethical to um, recruit children when we know that some of them will be harmed by getting one of the study drugs, which is um, the exhaling? Mm -hmm. And I think that has to be managed really carefully. We need to think about the ethical the ethical issues about that control group. This is something that's perhaps underplayed in the information that's given to parents. Certainly I think it is an issue, particularly with children that might suffer more severely from their asthma. And you might end up with a situation where these children are excluded from the study because it's not safe for them to have a washout period. I think there's really very little information in, in, in here about what the risks are of participating in this study. And they've, you know, they've, they've really haven't given any information about what happens if, you know, if their child gets worse mm -hmm. during the washout period. There's nobody who to contact, mm -hmm. where to get advice from. And whilst we're talking about gaps in information, I understand that uh, it's proposed they'll take saliva and we can't tell you how we'll use it in the future. No. Yeah. Well, given current furore around, you know, DNA databases oh. and, you know, yeah. spy industry, I don't feel very comfortable with that at all. That's also entirely omitted from the assent form and the consent yes. form for both um, the children and young people and the parents. So that's something that they most certainly need to explicitly give consent for and I find it remarkable that they've missed it out from, from those forms. I think it's inappropriate, wholly inappropriate, to... Uh, I think they, they determine that um, they will seek permission from, from children to take part, but they only require parental consent. We're talking about some young people who are 15, 16, 17, 18. They're old enough to vote, some of them. They're old enough to have children, and, and yet we're treating them like very young children themselves. And I thought that was mirrored by some of the language in the documentation for families. I thought it was both too complex for seven-year-olds and too patronising for 18-year-olds, and there wasn't enough nuance in it. it. It didn't seem to me as if the research team really understood children and young people. I feel a little concerned we're treating them as subjects of research. That's interesting because I don't know if you noticed that horrible word did slip into yes. one of the documents. Yes, so absolutely. we're certainly going to have to warn against that. I noticed that the that the word subject had been used rather than participant, both in the application form to us, but also in the information that would be provided to children and young people and also to their parents and carers, um, which just isn't best practice. So it's one of the problems that nobody has spoken up front to young people about what's important to them and therefore what might count as a good outcome measure for this project. I think there could be some reported outcome measures about you know, being able to participate in sports and how it's affected that or um, participating in social activities or how they felt in general, whether they felt better or worse. You know, I think that kind of information would be really important, particularly for the children and young people that have this condition. Yes, the school stuff's important, but it's not necessarily going to make me say, well, this I'm happy to now start using this medication. Mm -hmm. I want some good quality endpoints. So, you know, how much do they use their reliever medication? 
what their peak flow is, what their lung function tests are. That kind of information is of relevance to me as a clinician. Incentives. It's interesting, isn't it, in this project, that there is a small reward. I have to say it's very small in the scheme of things, a £20 voucher. First of all, if we're going to incentivise or reward, um, I think we have to think, is it at an appropriate level? How would you feel as an 18-year-old if you'd come for four additional appointments, kept a diary, logged in on a more or less daily basis, and you get... A £20 voucher at the end. Mm. I'd feel wholly insulted and patronised, frankly. It's not like when we were 18. 20 quid's not a lot of money these days. <laughs> and it doesn't get you very far. I don't think we can underestimate children's sort of altruistic motives for taking part in these sort of studies. And actually, I don't have a problem with £20. I think it's just a nice little gesture. If you gave too much, it would be a little bit over the top, and, and I, I would worry more about that. It's just a sort of a cherry on top of the cake. So everything brings us back to the science, doesn't it? We've got to go back to these researchers and say to them that it's a job worth doing, um, but it has to be done to a very high scientific standard. We're not comfortable with the current study design. And we think in redesigning the project, it's going to be crucially important to involve children and young people from the outset so that we can dismiss Desi's fears about subjects rather than participants and that the risks and benefits or potential benefits are set out clearly from the outset. If the children, young people and parents themselves were allowed to sort of be part of the, the development of the study, understand the important questions being asked, they're more likely to understand the whole process and to initially sort of uh, consent to take part to it, but actually to, to sort of stay with the study too. Well, thank you everyone. I think I've got a long and uh, rather diplomatic letter to write, but I think we've given this our best and I hope that we'll get a new protocol in within due course that we can look at again. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. For passionate professionals like the Professor, who are keen to pioneer new medical treatments for debilitating conditions like rubies, waiting for a decision from the Ethics Committee can be an anxious time. I am pretty sure they are going to ask us to make some changes, but it's very important for me to find out whether they are, in principle, backing the proposal or not. So, let's see. Ooh. The committee is keen to work with you to enable this valuable project to go ahead. However, they have said that they have a number of concerns about the apparent lack of involvement of children and young people in developing the trial design. So they are not very pleased with us referring to the children as subjects rather than participants. And I think that's, that's a very valid point. And they want to see us involving children and young people right through the period of the study. And I think we can achieve this. I, I don't think that's going to be a problem. One of the Ethics Committee's most serious concerns was a two-week washout period. They felt it put children like Ruby at too great a risk. There is quite a lot of evidence to indicate that it's, it's safe to stop medicines for two weeks. And I need to make the committee aware of these studies. And secondly, and I think just as importantly, because if we say that we are going to recruit patients right at the time when the third line defense medicine is being started, this trial will take 10 years to complete. It would need a much larger amount of money. We would have to recruit in many different clinics and it may not be feasible. Having enough information to decide whether to take part in a clinical trial is what's most important. At the end of the day, the success or failure of groundbreaking new medical research like this relies on the participation of children like Ruby.